Hello, my name is Debbie Boone and I want to welcome you to my podcast, The Bend, where we explore how successful people navigated the path and emerged in a better place when life threw them an unexpected twist. It's inspired by one of my favorite sayings, the bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the curve. These conversations will hopefully help you and inspire you to embrace your personal bend and to flourish. I hope you enjoy it. And if you need help with your own personal navigation and you're in veterinary medicine, please feel free to reach out to me at Debbie Boone to Manage Vets Consulting. Enjoy the bend and be inspired by our wonderful guest. Welcome. Welcome everyone to today's episode of The Bend. So today I want to introduce you to my friend, Anna Miller. Now, Anna and I met a long time ago at an IDEX conference, I think. Uh, One of our mutual friends introduced us and we've been buddies ever since. So she is one of what I would consider to be the rock star young managers that I have seen in the profession and kind of followed her career. And I'm really excited to introduce her today. She is now the... Um, operations manager for a new company called uh, Acara, and which means, hey, friend in Gaelic, which I love. She is a licensed veterinary technician, and she has uh, many, many years of experience in the veterinary profession, even though she's very young. So (laughs) thank you for that. Thank you for that part. (laughs) So welcome, Anna, and thanks for your time today and for being on The Bend. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited, so excited and humbled. And if I ever get an opportunity to talk in front of people about our industry and our field, I'll do it anytime. Perfect. Great. Well, here's here's an opportunity. So let's I always like to start out with the how'd you get there or hear from there. So how did you get started, you know, being an LVT, being in the vet, being in vet med? I got started in this field the same way everybody does. We all love animals. Sometimes our childhood, we kind of gravitate to them because they don't judge us. They always love us. And and that's really easy to gravitate towards and always just wanted to to take care of them and, but, but more take care of them on an intimate level. And so when I went to tech school, I had a lot of people and I used to take it so personal. I still kind of do when they say, why don't you want to go to vet school? Why would you not want to be a vet? Um, And while we have amazing doctors in our field, you know, the answer is because I do want that intimate one. I want to be the one extubating them when they wake up Mm -hmm. and seeing them. I want to be the one taking 25 minutes, taking too long to go over discharges, right? (laughs) So, and I enjoy that part. And again, everybody has a place in the clinic that's great, but I just really wanted that Mm one-on-one part with them. And so after school, I started at a large specialty hospital. Um, It was kind of on a dare actually that I interviewed (laughs) Because I didn't think I would get, and I was like, okay, let's do this. And then the manager called and was like, come on over. It was, oh my gosh. So now I was like, okay, it was a big, uh, really good hospital. And so I was an anesthesia tech there. And so that hospital did an amazing job of helping employees figure out what they want to do. Really empowered. And I know that's a buzzword right now, but really the definition of empowered mm-hmm. people if they saw like, Hey, you're really good at this. How can we give you resources? Is it extra CE? Is it sending you to UT to do anesthesia with Dr. Harvey? You know, where do we go? And so that was really intoxicating Mm -hmm. and really good to have somebody really believe in you and even push you there. So, um, so then I knew I wanted to kind of come back to specialty medicine, but I also wanted to experience general practice and uh, cause that all has its place. And I ended up managing a large small animal clinic. It was a mixed practice at first, even though I will say have no idea how to do large animal medicine <laughs> at all, at all. No, I just now, know. Now, I don't, they make you take a ro- uh, a rotation right in your yeah. WT class. And then you have to go and do an, uh, some externships in large animal medicine. So you, you, I barely passed them. Yeah. 
past. <laughs> there's the past him, David. You probably don't want me saying that. Um, but yeah, it, I just couldn't click with them. And again, mm-hmm. I'm so much of a one-on-one person and just with small animal, like I click with mm-hmm. them. And I just couldn't with large animal, but, um, but yes, God love large animal vets and techs. We need you as well. Uh, so, so managed that one and then had a, a really good opportunity to build a new mm-hmm. small clinic. And so that one, that was a rough one. That, that one, was- I, I remember, cause I think I came and visited you at that hospital and it was brand new at that mm-hmm. time. I got a little tour of it, really cool hospital. And you, you had done a lot of the physical work in that hospital we painted it because yeah when it comes to you know start it we wanted to make sure that we started it you know as cheap as we could because we were afraid nobody's going to come to us right <laughs> so, yes. so we, we were able to all business and, owners yeah so we learned a lot about hvac um and <laughs> city plumbing issues so uh so yeah that was a, a really good a really good learning experience and opportunity then I was at another specialty hospital, but it's, it was corporate for NVA. And so I don't know if I'm supposed to say NVA. You can probably edit that out. Um, <laughs> but, but a specialty emergency, large hospital. I ended up being there, what was called an RRM, which is a referral relationship manager. And it was a much slower pace mm-hmm. than I was used to. Like we thrive in chaos in this field. Mm-hmm. Right? So that was kind of weird, but but I did start to like it. My job was fostering these relationships between the general practice community and the specialty hospital. Mm-hmm. Cause I, I knew where each one of them is coming from mm-hmm. and just helping the other understand the other. And so uh, that was also a really good experience. And then, uh, but the, then found out about this new startup and kind of bring in all those skills and resources together that I've learned to, to see if we can, open up some general hospitals and see if we can change vet med a little bit yeah. one client at a time. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that you said that I want to go back to is how lucky you were in your first hospital to mm-hmm. have somebody who said, this is what she really likes to do. Let's grow that. Mm-hmm. Because I, I feel like the same way I was, you know, I had a degree in animal science. My goal in life was to be a veterinarian. Then I changed my mind. I didn't want to do it anymore. And I've never regretted it. I've always been glad that I was in the position I was in as the manager because I was in the periphery of the medicine, but I never had to do anything, right? I was allowed to learn Mm -hmm. and grow in that position. I was given autonomy and guidance. And I look back and look at so many other hospitals as a consultant now that I'm in there and I think, wow how lucky I was. And I I actually got the opportunity one time at Connexity when I was speaking that my old boss came to hear me speak. And I got to say, I just want to thank my, my former boss is here. You know, I worked for him for 19 years and he taught me how to run a veterinary hospital, make money in a veterinary hospital. And then I joked and said, and I taught him how to be nice. because Probably was a little bit of that. There might have been a little bit of that. It was a lot of that because he was a really high driver personality. And uh, I was able to to kind of take some of that pressure off of that personality and let him relax a little bit and have a little fun working in the hospital. And I was the buffer between him and the staff a lot of times. So, but it really is, you know, giving your people opportunity to grow is such a valuable thing. And so many times we're not letting our staff flourish in the places that they need to flourish. You know, if there's, we we want everybody to fit in all the holes and sometimes they're, they're a square peg and that's not going to work. Laughingly say, don't put somebody who's extroverted counting inventory in the stock room. They won't do it well and they won't stay in there because they're lonesome and bored. So you got to put people where they are happy and where they should be. Um, And then they will actually take ownership of that position and take it places you never even thought of because it's not your thing. Yeah. And it's, and it is cool because then if you look back and and something that I really liked about that practice, Anacara is by doing that, you know, the whole saying you're, you don't want to be the smartest person in the room. You want to make people smarter than you. Like they, they did that. And so does Akara. They're like, no, I want you to be smarter. There's an ego there. And so yeah. when you look around the room, you know, you're surrounded by those people that are 
better and more knowledgeable with certain things to have a good company. Yeah. Sorry about the dog barking. That's a. <laughs> Did you just spray your dog? I, I, I've i got a little can of air and his breeder trained him to quit barking with the squirt of canned air. So that hopefully will stop him from barking, but we'll see how it works. He's sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. So, um, so Anna, tell us about how life, you know, threw you a curveball and some of the challenges that you face to, to be the success that you are. Thank, thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, we all get curveballs. I feel like I get them every day, but, um, on different levels, but I did want to give a trigger warning that mm -hmm. I'm going to discuss childhood sexual abuse as part of my history. So if anybody is triggered by that or wants to take a minute to hop off, I did just want to give a heads up on that. Thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Um, so, so yeah, so from the age of about 11 to 14, I was, um, sexually abused by a close family member. That brings so much trauma that's so many other podcasts with it, right? But I'll go over it in a second. But the way that that unknowingly transformed my career at one point for the bad, to be honest, mm. and I still fight it today, right? And so mm. uh, during that time, if anybody is familiar with childhood sexual abuse, in the minute, in the moment, and especially if it's by a family member, you you don't know what's happening, and your brain does a phenomenal job, phenomenal job, of protecting you. Uh, there's a really good book called The Body Keeps Score, and it talks about how yeah. your body can do this, but at some point, it's like, it's we got to do something. So I started developing, not knowing, but some coping skills that at the time were really good. I started um, competitive gymnastics, mm -hmm. which was really good. It is a team sport, but at the end of the day, you rely on yourself. You get what you put into it, right? Um, Tucker says, absolutely, amen. So, um, so unfortunately that is a sport that does not allow for any error. And so looking back that again, gymnastics is an amazing sport and I'm not blaming it on that. Uh, Again, kind of didn't think that my childhood, I didn't remember a ton of balance, didn't think it affected me because I was doing well. Mm -hmm. I'm taking care of animals. Life is great. And so when I did start at the first, you know, the first clinic, again, it's not their fault of this unhealthy coping skill, but I was really addicted to doing well. Mm -hmm. And we all are, we all want to mm -hmm. do it, but it became my identity because that's my value, right? Mm -hmm. My value has been, I've taught myself over time. And you don't know in the moment that it's bad. Cause you're like, I'm taking care of animals. I'm not a drug dealer. I'm not. Yeah. So yeah. I'm fine. And so it really just kind of snowballed from there. Um, I had my first daughter, I have three, but I had my first daughter and had some postpartum depression. This is when I was in the specialty hospital. And again, when your body does keep score of, of things that's going on, you can be trucking along, not remembering things. But then when you have life changing things like a child, mm -hmm. that's when things stop, your coping skills just run out. And so had some depression with that. And so that's kind of why I moved to, to GP to manage just to kind of get things a little bit different and then found out again my value in doing a really good job. If the P and L statements were good, I have value. And you have value. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, As, you know, this is so interesting. About a year ago, I read a book um, and I don't know if you've read it, but I would suggest that you have, it was written by Oprah Winfrey. And um, I can't remember the man's name who was, he's a psychiatrist, a child psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And it's called what happened to you. And we, we think, you know, when we have people who are problems or they have dysfunction, that there's something wrong with them. Right. And the truth of the matter is it's probably childhood trauma from, a, a you know, your age, you were talking about, you know, like at 11, but sometimes it's in infancy that the trauma happens and that people don't feel in the, in the one place that you feel like you should be the safest, which is in your family you are not safe. And once you kind of realize that, that it's not you, it was the circumstances, right? It was 
all the things that conspired against you um, as a child when you could not protect yourself and you did not have the the power, right, to say no or to tell anybody or to even know to even know what yeah. was going on, you know, what it was, uh, because you count on the adults in your life to give you guidance and they guided you, you know, inappropriately. So it, it was just to me an eye opening book. And when you said it, animals were mm -hmm. my, my thing it's where I connected, it's where I reached out. But I think there's so many people in veterinary medicine who may be in this same position where animals were the safety they were the ones who you knew were not going to harm you. And they were the emotional connection, right? I mean, the, the connection, but also the, the, the sure love mm -hmm. that you knew you could get from those animals. And I think there's so many people in our profession that migrated maybe because of that to animal profession and, and, and it kind of exacerbates that high empathy that they have for animals too, where, you know, others, I kind of grew up a farm girl and it's like, I'm a little more practical about animals, but um, I've seen some people who are just like, you know, they want to save and rescue everything. I'm like, girl, you know, you can't afford your rent. You really don't need 10 dogs. And yeah. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Practical. Yeah. 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 So, a, a, you know, really, really fascinating transition it, to all the things that I've been learning about um, a childhood trauma and moving it into the world where we live, which is vet med. Um, I think that's really amazing. Um, and I appreciate that you shared that story because it's it's probably going to resonate with a lot of people in our world. Unfortunately, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, so. yeah. Do you think you just kind of develop this, um, I have to be perfect people pleasing because of the abuse? Like this was your way to be, um, to, to, like you said, to be valuable. I do. I yeah. really do. Uh, took a lot of, a lot of intensive therapy that's yeah. trauma-based, not fun, but glad I did it. But as we unpacked everything, because when I first, here's, here's the weird thing. And here's how I know is when I first went to, to therapy, she was like, why are you here? I was like, to be a better person on my team at work. And she was like, we have so much work to do. <laughs> <laughs> I truly, that yeah. was my answer because it was, that is my identity. I have to stay late. I have to take care of all these animals. Yeah. I have to take care of all the mad clients. I have to empower our staff. So it wasn't all the time mm -hmm. selfish. Mm -hmm. It was if I, and again, it's unknowing, right? Mm -hmm. But if I can do this and I connect with dogs and nobody's judging me, that's my value. Mm -hmm. And But that runs out. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, because physically and mentally, you can't handle that much. You can't take all of that on mm -hmm. and survive, you know, and be yourself, you know, be your, you have your own life. Um, and, and yeah, definitely. I see it. I see it in managers who are answering emails at midnight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no boundaries. I see it in veterinarians who were taking calls from people they saw in high school and haven't seen in 20 years. And they, they take those calls. And I, I just really feel like, uh, learning those good boundaries is so important, but also understanding why you feel like you have to yes. talk to those people and yeah. feel guilty if you don't, you know, that's the other thing. How, why do you feel guilty if you don't do those things? Because these are people who are, who are basically willing to take advantage of your good nature. Yeah. When you think about it, yeah. 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 They are. Yeah. yeah. I just had a conversation with one of our doctors about that. And then I was like, I think I came across me because she was like, I'm trying to find a rescue for this lady. And I, you know, I haven't seen her in seven years. And I was like, you're amazing, but please stop. Stop that. Know, that is taking up. You can direct them where to go. That is our job to direct. Here's some suggestions, but taking up, taking those people, that, that lady's problem on mm -hmm. is another way that we're getting exhausted and burned yeah, out. And exactly. Well, it's, and it's the same way with trying to find financial means for people to pay. Mm -hmm. um, you know, years ago, people would come in and like, oh, I don't have any money. Well, that's really not my burden. 
I mean, I will help you. I will give you suggestions, but I'm not going to do the work for you. So here's a list of charities. Here's a list of websites. Here's a list of financing companies. Here's some ideas. And then you take it and run with it. And this is, you know, this is not my problem to solve. So I, I think we take ownership of other people's problems way too much <laughs> in veterinary medicine. And it's because that's the nature of the beast. That's who we are, those caregivers. And, and we want to, we're here to help. You know, we really are here to help. And then to have people come at you and go, you don't care is the ultimate insult for us because we know that we care beyond what normal people care, right? About about the animals and even about our clients. But you, you talked about going to therapy and tell me about that. Is that was that scary for you? It is it was. So I had tried therapy a few times. Mm-hmm. This and this was a last ditch effort. This one was like. I'm not, I was not doing, I had three kids at the time. So this started about six or seven years ago and my coping skills were surrounding myself with people at work and friends where I allowed them to take advantage of me. Right. Cause that's all we know. Mm-hmm. At some point. And so, um, it was just getting to where like, okay, these skills are not working. And so I went to in Greenville, South Carolina, the Julie Valentine center. And that is our local CAC, Children's Advocate Center, and also um, Rape Crisis Center. Um, And it was weird because I'm not a kid, right? And so, you know, going there and telling them, you're expecting just to give them a PowerPoint on why you are the way that you are, right? (laughs) But here it is, right? And again, when I offer I actually uh, asked if I could have a star chart um, on the second visit. And again, that's when she was like, yep, we got to get some things to do, (laughs) you know, it just compared to how well I'm doing. So when I graduated therapy, she gave me a bunch of gold stars. But when you go to a a counseling place like that, they specialize in trauma. Mm -hmm. They specialize in helping you unpack coming alongside you as you go whatever path you need to go down and their patient they don't sit down and say what happened to you Mm -hmm. they let you figure it out and so that's why it was so painful so painful remove putting those boundaries there and removing myself um from some not healthy people Mm -hmm right? It's lonely. That's mm-hmm. the one thing I used to tell my therapist. You didn't tell me to be this lonely to get healthy. Um, and so it's, it's, it's very hard. And um, I was told at one point, even, you know, is this a healthy field for you and where you are? Mm-hmm. Because it, unfortunately, I love this field, but because of all the reasons we've talked about, we're not super healthy all the time. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So again, that's the goal of stuff like this is to to hopefully try to be So, uh, so yeah, therapy was terrifying. I didn't want to do it, but also I learned at first again, I went so I could be a better team member. And then I learned, oh, this is about me giving my voice back. This is about me being able to say, Hey, I gave 110% at work, but I don't have to stay till eight o'clock. Yeah. (laughs) There's, there's me doing a good job. And I remember when my therapist was like, you just go in and do a good job. And I was like, but I don't understand that. That's who I am. <laughs> you know? So my identity was in every, everything oh, yeah. related yeah. and that therapy helped undo that painfully. I'm not going to lie. Mm-hmm. Um, very painfully. Mm-hmm. That's something I still struggle with today. Yeah. Um, so when you, when you graduated from therapy, what changes did you make um, because of what you had learned? I mean, obviously some people left that didn't need to be there. That's a good one. Cause it's, I still have to check myself and that's a good reminder from you. Thank you. Of, of, of doing, of making sure that I'm a healthy person for people. I have to take care of my own toxic traits, um, but also allowing myself to be around healthy people, which can take time is very hard. Cause that was the main thing for me. I did make a job switch that I didn't really want to take. That's just because the RRM role was just a little bit slower, but it's exactly what I needed to be to heal because mm-hmm. I could not have physically, mentally, emotionally, I could not have healed 
as an active manager at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just couldn't. Separating work slowly, but making sure I was doing a good job. That's that's the part that was hard and is still hard. And over time, I will say, even in the last year, even in the last year, I've been able to say, okay, I did really good with this, this, and this. I'm good. The team's good. It's okay if yeah, I'm not emailing on a Saturday, yeah. you know, and it's, it's okay if that owner is mad and I did everything we could. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be devastated because I didn't fix this mad owner, right? Mm -hmm. Because when that's your value. So just really understanding that these things are things not related to how bad you are or you know, still take responsibility for things that are yours, but, but that's the main steps that I really had to take was just being so self-aware and surround yourself with people that will call you out. Yeah. I don't yeah. like that. It made me think about, it's kind of like being a good boss to yourself, because when you're a good boss, you call people on the things that they're doing that, that are inappropriate, but you don't, it's their behavior. It's not that them, right? It's not that they're a bad person. It's that they behaved badly or they, they made an error, but that doesn't mean that you think any less of them or that they are not a valuable person. It just means they made a mistake. You know, they're human and they made a mistake. So it seems that it's allowing yourself not to be perfect mm -hmm. and being okay with that because the, you know, humans are not perfect and we screw up. So um, I, I really, I think that's a valuable lesson. And there's so many perfectionists in vet med mm -hmm. and being able to say, you know, I don't know the answer. I don't have to have the answer. And I don't have to be responsible for everybody all the time. And I think that's when you're a manager you do feel responsible for your team and good leaders do that because they do care about their people, but people have responsibilities for themselves. I can remember being on a bus going to the airport, one of those transfers from the parking lot to the, to the terminal. And it was just me and this other lady on the bus and the bus driver asked what we were doing. And I said, I had come to teach a class and the other lady said, well, I came to fire somebody. <laughs> and, yeah. And she was an HR person for some big corporate group. And he said, oh, you didn't come to fire somebody. He said, people fire themselves. He said, you just came to confirm it. And I went, oh, what a really great line. This is from the bus driver. Confirm. And I've always remembered it. And, and I said, it's true because I can't take responsibility that I have people who don't show up for work or who are rude to clients or who do not perform their services well. They did that. They have to own that. My responsibility is to not subject the rest of my team to those people anymore once I know those things and um and I can't fix people it's just like people marry men thinking they're going to fix them you can't fix them either <laughs> you are what they are you try you can try you can try people people grow but you can't fix them they have to fix themselves that's their job that's their duties um so now I'm curious about like decision making so we you know you move through some different positions and obviously the decision to move into being the uh, manager for a referral, which is really cool because, you know, I think there is a lot of disconnect between general practitioners and referral doctors and back and forth. And sometimes there's some judgment that goes in there and the GPs feel judged if they don't know the stuff and the, and the specialists feel aggravated that the GPs didn't send them all the stuff that they need. And yeah, I mean, I've, I've been there, so I get it. Um, <laughs> But I, but, you know, choosing to make a move um, for what you needed, how did you decide um, when the time was right and when to make those moves? Mm -hmm. The decision was kind of made for me in the sense of my, my body really uh, mm -hmm. mentally and, and emotionally, you know, then this other opportunity came up at the, for the RRM role. And, you know, and I am a believer. And so I do believe in God ordained things mm -hmm. um, and that timing and talking a lot with my therapist, again, me and my therapist, best friends for a long time, but, you know, talking to her, you know, and just saying, hey, this is, you know, my husband and, 
everybody just being like, you, you really have to do this. You'll do well, blah, blah, blah. Cause that's always our fear that we want. Um, and it was, it was so perfect for what I needed at the time. It was so perfect for just needing that space to heal mm -hmm. and, and show up how I did, which isn't always how we want to, mm -hmm. um, but sometimes that's just where we are. And so I, I had that space to do that. And I would not have been able to give to a team if I was on the floor manager mm -hmm. aspect. So, you know, the decision-making was kind of my body's decision <laughs> to say, Hey, we can't, we can't do this. Yeah. Uh, we can't do this anymore. So a lot of prayer, a lot of talking to people to make sure it was the good call. Painful, painful, uh, cried for about a year. Oh, oh, well. And then to do it again, <laughs> to go with a startup and say, oh, you know what? I'm going to take a brave leap here. But I, I know that you know the practice owner well, so that probably made it a little bit easier because you were going to uh, somebody that you admired and respected. And I, I know Dermot, so I know uh, who you're working with, but um, yeah. What made you go, okay, now I'm ready for another change, another leap. Right. And especially a new startup of hospitals yeah. in this industry where we are. And I'm still, even this morning, I was like, are we sure we know what we're doing, buddy? <laughs> uh, to my boss. That's a really good question. I was on the line for a while just because, because of the industry, to be honest with you. But then also my boss at the hospital, the corporate hospital I was at, he was like, you would be an idiot to not do this. You're ready for mm -hmm. this. Cause I was like, oh no, I'm not going to do this. And he was like, well, I'm going to fire you and make you do it. So, <laughs> so uh, when, and it's funny you ask that because two years ago I would have wanted everybody's opinion and is this right and at that time just where I'd kind of grown I was like no I just don't think I want to so I'm not going to and that was even new mm -hmm. to my own opinion um and so kind of talked about it a little bit more and just decided I think good bad ugly experiences that I've had when it comes to to building hospitals and managing them and wanting to have a diverse background is this why? Is this why? And I don't know if this is is my last step. I do like to stretch the boundaries of the LVT role just to show that we can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> kind of yeah, good for you. This is so that we can. So that's why I do have a diverse background. Like we, we can do a lot of things and, and really cool things. So I do feel like it's a move that is a square peg in a square. Yeah, <laughs> square, square peg, square hole. Yeah, I do. I really feel like it's, it's an amazing team and it's a safe team. You know, the first day, there's only a few of us. The first day they were like, we are going to have fun. We are going to do a good job and take care of animals, but we're also going to be mentally and emotionally safe. You hear that right now, buzzwords, all the things, Absolutely. but they, do, they walk the walk. Mm -hmm. You know, I've kind of even tested them. Like, what are they going to do with this? <laughs> How do they respond to this? Um, and so they really, uh, really walk the walk of, of what we're saying we're going to do. And I know that we can't change veterinary medicine, but that idea of, okay, we can make some hospitals and do our best mm -hmm. and, and invest in these managers, invest in these doctors, help bring all of the stuff that, that I have again, good, bad, ugly, and really help truly mentor and come alongside these doctors, owners, and then the manager and see how they can complement each other instead of magnets, right? Mm -hmm. I see that all the time. It, that got me very excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's such a synergy when you work well with your medical director, or, I mean, I think about my first practice and my boss was great. I mean, he was, and he looked after the doctors, he looked after the medicine, I looked after the staff. We talked about the money together, but I had such autonomy, but I also was invested in, I mean, I, I got training. I got mm -hmm. uh, the information that I needed. I, there were 
basically no secrets from me in the hospital. And because of that, the last six months before he retired, he didn't even work in the building. He moved to Florida, <laughs> established residency, and I ran the hospital with the associate veterinarians. And he would come up once a month and do some special procedures that nobody else could do. And then he'd go back to Florida. So practice owners realize that when they highly leverage their managers and their team appropriately, they get a better life. Yeah. They really do get a better life. And the managers too. And, and that's saying what you, the point that you made, investing in the education of the managers, because a lot of times, you know, you have people who are a yeah. great receptionist or great technicians they go, oh they're, they're really good at this job I'm just going to make you manage the hospital but yeah. they don't teach you how to manage the hospital you know for me I was lucky because I grew up in business my family owned restaurants I was trained to run businesses from a very young age I understood profit and loss statements and payroll and how to mark up food products in, in setting fees, all those kind of things I came to the table with and a degree in animal science. But so many managers don't have any of that. And then they struggle and they make mistakes and they actually create toxic work environments because they don't know how to make corrections or to coach their team or to set those appropriate boundaries, even for themselves um, and or handle conflict you know they avoid conflict or they my favorite thing to talk about when we're talking about staff meetings is do not bring your entire team in and fuss at them all about a mistake one person made right and the, yeah don't do any of those things right yeah. yes, because all those other people are going well I don't do that I don't do that and so the person who's made the mistake is looking around going well everybody must be making the same mistake because it's not just me so it, it, it was such a waste of time, but it's a way that we avoid confrontation one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. because we don't know how to do it right. And teaching people how to do that right is so very important to building a great team. So kudos to you guys for this appropriate plan to, to train the managers, train the owners and build the culture because that makes all the difference in the world. You know, I'm obviously an advocate for communication training. And I really do believe that when we start to teach veterinary team members how to communicate and how their brain works and probably some of the stuff that you learned in therapy about the false stories that we tell ourselves, right? You, you, the false story you were telling yourself is I have to be perfect. I have to do more than my job in order to for people to appreciate me as a person, you know, to have value as a human. And none of that's true. Or I can't, confront somebody because they'll be mad at me and they'll never forgive me. No, you can do that. You just have to do it correctly. So if we would teach people better communication, we would not have a lot of the problems that we have in vet med. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. We kind of talk about this all the time and joke about it, but the mental health of our industry is not a joke. Please don't hear it. Not saying, but just talk about, we've taken a ton of people who are for the most part introverts, right? Mm -hmm. are introverts um we that don't like people mm -hmm. like animals and then said here go tell this person that they got to give us fifty two hundred dollars for a tplo bye right exactly one 30 seconds out of all of these things so i think it really goes both ways of having veterinary owners that sounds terrible not not know their place that's not mm -hmm. what i meant but to empower and get a manager, like let the doctors do doctor stuff, mm -hmm. let your managers, because again, I, I did a lot of creating the toxic environment because I didn't know the expectation. So I'm going to make it all me. And then sometimes I was empowering other staff, but sometimes I wasn't. So they didn't know what to expect, you know? Um, so it's, it's that, and it's, Again, I think it does come back to ego for everybody, even managers when it comes to having a lead tech, right? Mm -hmm. uh, okay, there is a vulnerability. If I teach this person this, they're going to be better than me. Yeah. 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 Or and you better hope so. I mean, yeah. your, your greatest goal as a manager is to be bored, right? Yes. Yeah. 
And and people were like, oh, but I, but if I don't do it, right? So if you think about delegation, I think what happens to a lot of managers is, is stuff just comes up. Like there's a new software or you need to put phone system in or there's a new app and you and you're the one who learns and investigates it. So you you're putting this into your basket, right? And all of a sudden you look in this basket, it is like overflowing with stuff, more stuff than you could possibly do. And you've not taught anybody else how to do it. And so you're like, oh, I can't be off work. I can't, I have to stay late. I have to finish this, this, and this, and nobody else can do it. But the truth of the matter is somebody else could do it if you would teach them how to do it immediately, pass that off. So the, the idea that a manager is not supposed to do the work, but is supposed to see that the work is done and make sure that all the all the balls are in the air, but not to be, you know, the one who's holding them all, right? Oh, Just wow. make sure everybody's got their own ball and that they're they're doing what they're supposed to be doing with it. But it's it's sometimes it's fear if if I do let go of it, that somebody they won't need me anymore. Where's your value? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So to not be needed is a great thing as a manager. As a manager, yes. Yeah. Yes. You yeah. want your team to just do. I can remember my my boss was um, a hoot. And like I said, I'd worked there for a really long time. And he came about 15 years into it. He came and said, Debbie Boone, if you ever quit, I'm coming after you with a shotgun. And I said, Dr. Cobb, if I ever quit, you will never know I'm gone because this team knows their jobs and they know what to do. And when I walk out the door, they will continue to know their jobs and know exactly what to do. And that's exactly what happened. I mean, a lot of the people that I hired back in the 2000s are still in this practice. There is no turnover. So yeah, you, you have a great culture. You have retention. People know their jobs and it runs like a Ferrari. Um, you just got to step back and let it run. I, and I never really understood that because, you know, Dermot used to say the same thing when I first started. It's like, no, like you should not know if I'm in the building or not. And that was so foreign to me. Mm -hmm. Like, why would you give your secrets away? Why would you do that? You know, like, how, how do you wake up in the morning? You know, and so understanding that, you know, in those resources, just, just learning that, like, I hope even if it's a couple of practices where we can help that bond with that manager and that team, then it's, it's going to be worth it. That's the part I'm most excited about mm -hmm. is to help that relationship between mm -hmm. the doctor owner and the manager is very excited about that part. Yeah. Well, you know, once you've, once you've seen it, it it's easier to model it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It's the people who've never seen it work. Don't, don't have a concept of how, it is supposed to work together. And there are practices who certainly do it well. And I know uh, managers who are just superstars at this and they they and their owners have this great symbiotic relationship. And that's exactly how it's supposed to run. And it's fun to go to work. Mm -hmm. That's that's the great thing about it. It's really enjoyable to go to work. Everybody's got everybody's back and the clients get served and the patients get served well because- if when you don't have turnover, people learn their jobs and they run like a well-oiled machine. You don't have to micromanage them. They know what to do. And, and often if you give them some autonomy and some leadway, they will create a system that much better than you ever created. Much better than what, because right. We have all these things in our basket. We've been talking about <laughs> exactly right. And, so and you don't do the work, right? So the people who do the work should create the systems and this morning, I actually had a conversation with a, um, an associate who was kind of lashing out at some of the staff because of his frustrations. And then when we find out that he's coming into a practice and he doesn't have supplies and his packs are not appropriately packed and he can't do surgery, and he gets in the middle of a surgery with no medicine, bomb scissors. And so, you know, these things are are frustrating. And then when the system is broken then it's really hard to keep a good culture when people are, uh, you know, like, uh, like pushing the rope. Like that's what I call it, pushing the rope and you can't get anything done because the, the system is broken. So you can have great culture. You can have EAPs to help your mental health, but you got to put the systems in place that get the work done and make the workflows make sense. And, and so people are not frustrated every day with something 
like the broken autoclave that you have to jack it with a pin in order to make it balance, you know, stuff like that. And it's you out know, there. It's, it's out there. It's true. We yeah. time and motion studies. I love doing those. Mm -hmm. With the clinics, I was like, do not put doors on cabinets. Do not put a door on a cabinet in lab. I will die on that hill. But you're right. They're so, and we kind of timed it. Mm -hmm. Like how many times you're reaching for a refractometer and you hit someone on the head and you have to open it. Just taking kind of that and again, giving it to, to different employees and really trying to model that because, you know, like you said, it's a moot point. If we're doing the EAPs and we're doing everything right, it doesn't matter if no. the refractometer is on the top shelf and you can't reach it because it's closed by the fridge. It, right. Yeah. Yeah. Or you got to get a step stool every time you need to get anything out of, out of the shelf. Yeah, you're exactly right. Or it makes no sense. You know, I uh, I interviewed um, Rachel Lemke on this show and Rachel is an expert in setting up and, and um, negotiating laboratory fees and, mm -hmm. and negotiating those contracts and stuff for the labs. And she said, I would go into hospitals and they would have the refrigerator over here and the analyzer over here. And so every time you needed reagent, you're walking back and forth from the refrigerator all the way down the length of the of the of the lot of the lab to to put stuff in the machine and so it's just the logical uh save me steps set it up so that it makes sense kind of stuff that sometimes is missing in animal hospitals one of my big complaints and i've i can't even tell you how many architects i have nailed to the cross about this one is do not put your receptionist at a low desk because it puts them in a hole and it makes the clients feel like they can tower over them and verbally abuse them because they're down there below them. Put them up like a bank teller and put me face to face with you. That way I have equal power in my body language and you can't disrespect me down in that hole. Not to mention ergonomically up and down, up and down, up and down, killing your knees 50 times a day. And you know the other thing that, that irritates me is that in treatment rooms, we need rolling mechanics stools because <laughs> one of the things that that makes us have mental health problems, <laughs> physical problems. If you're chronically in pain, you cannot feel mentally good. And so why not put a stool in there so that you are not on your knees and up and down five million times a day? That is one of my gripes. And the cage banks that I've never seen a job, this dog, is 12 pounds and he can jump three feet straight in the air. Why can't we put cage banks up higher so our technicians are not standing on their heads recovering an animal that weighs 80 pounds in a cage that is too low? You have some passion behind that, Debbie. I that, am. That's, that's you know, it aggravates me to not do smart things with things we work with every day. And, and there's just so much logic behind it. But we've always done it that way, right? So... Let's always keep doing it that way because that's how Shoreline makes cage bait. So we can't change that. So we can't. Yeah. Well, one of our ER techs, you know, ER, fast pace. Mm -hmm. it's so I kind of like saw her kind of, and she's kind of steady Eddie, mm -hmm. right? Um, nothing much shakes her. And so somebody, I don't even know why, had moved the toilet paper holder and put the CPCR thing there. I... It was the last straw for her. And that's why things like this, <laughs> it was the last straw for her. And she like jerked it down and was like, oh my gosh, put the, put the dis paper towel dispenser there. And that's, you know, those moments of like people saying, oh, she's overly dramatic. And I was just kind of looking like, no, she's not. Yeah. We're yeah. being stupid. We're being real stupid. We're being <laughs> stupid about it. I mean, I really, that. yeah, it's the truth. Yeah. I mean. I can remember when we were remodeling our treatment room, having a really big discussion about where the paper towel holders were going to be, because it matters. How many times a day do you reach for that? And it needs to be somewhere you can just reach your arm back and grab it and not have to move a step to do it. So there was this huge debate because we had changed the cabinetry and stuff in this room about how to, how to do paper towel holders. But those are the kind of decisions that make a difference for years and save you time for years if you spend the time on what seems to be a minuscule thing. But all those things matter. And, uh, you know, why do we, 
why don't we get a cage bank and put lactated ringers in the top cage? That's the heaviest thing. Yeah. The heaviest thing we have, you know, why do we do that? And why don't we have drawers underneath cage banks that we can put lactated ringers in <laughs> and put other fluids and stuff like that? Because they weigh a ton. So let's not pick them up off the ground. So, yeah. So anyway, that's I, I, like I said, I told you we would get off on other tangents. Oh. So. I love I love that part. That's what we're doing now is building some things and having, but no, I do think it's, it's pertinent because I do think that also shows employees that you do care about the small yes. things. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, it, you know, I, I've built a couple of hospitals from the ground up. And one of the things I always did was have the employees come in and look at the plans and I say, mentally move through these and see if this makes sense. Can you walk two dogs by each other in the kennel runs? If not, there's a problem. So getting your employees involved in these in these decisions um, gives them buy-in for one thing, but it also says, you know, they really care about my thoughts and my work and making it as easy as possible, even though it's, you know, it's physically challenging work, but there's things that we can do to certainly make it better when we do that. Yeah. So Anna, um, what do you consider to be your biggest career mistake? I know this is going to sound so cliche, but I don't have any. Well, two years ago, I would have given you a, a laundry list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> two years ago, I would have said, I shouldn't have worked here. and I shouldn't have done this. Blah, 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 blah. But again, as I'm still trying to, to work on myself every day, uh, you know, when I was kind of going over how to answer this stuff with you, it was like, as painful as some of it was, again, I think I really feel like it all teed me up, teed me up to be able to say we may not know what we always want to do but when we don't want to do that you know those kind of things and we're we're gonna mess up and you know next week if you ask me that question I may have something different to tell you but <laughs> as of right now as painful as it's been I really I would yeah I would do it all the exact same yeah yeah I, I love the way it teed me up to be where I am today and I think that's that's kind of a consistent theme that I've seen throughout doing these podcasts with people is even though there were challenges and they were in a place that maybe wasn't good or, but they learned something from it and they took what they learned and they used it to move to the next step, not go back that rabbit hole again. So it was all a learning experience. And I always think every hospital that I've worked in, every place that I've been, every job that I've had has has given me the skill set that I have today mm -hmm. to be able to do what I do and um, certainly learn something every single day all the time. I, I always like to ask people about networking because I feel like sometimes there's a negative connotation to networking, like a used car salesman, glad handing salesperson kind of deal. So tell me what you think about networking and the value to your career. So the value of net, I think this is the value of networking. <laughs> I do, you know, um, seven years ago, I was fangirling over, you know, meeting Debbie Boone and we kept in contact and you're, you're so approachable and finding people like that again, finding more people like that because we don't like to talk to people in this field, uh -huh. but forcing ourselves to talk to people and just reach in with them. You don't have to be best friends um, is, is how we get to where we are that hopefully one person has been helped by this episode, you know, and that's all just because of networking, just checking on people. You know, I tell people, even if it's after every CE, I don't care if it's VMX or your local VMA and there were seven people there. If you have somebody's card and new, shoot them an email. Yeah. Send them a card. I had one vet I sent him a card just because he was so super nice. He was older and he was floored. I met him at AHA and I feel bad. I can't remember his name. And he was like, no one sent me a card. And we didn't even talk that long. Huh? And it flattered him. And he was like, okay. So, and again, it took me two seconds, but he, he you know, that re confirmed like, okay, we're good people in this mm -hmm. field. We're, mm -hmm. we're good people and we can learn, hey, don't pick cabinets doors on there from <laughs> discussing don't make the same mistake that we did and and I feel very strongly very strongly about that 
because while we can all push the, you know, I love not one more vet. I love what they do. I think I kind of even at least approach that as in owners versus us. Mm -hmm. Owners are always leaving a bad review because, but then I really started to say like, I think that starts within our clinic. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I really do. It's, it's, it's not us against the owners. I really think it has to do with how we treat each other mm-hmm. in the clinic and treat the other clinics. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, that's, what's got to stop. I mean, got to fix and address before, um, before we say, Hey, people treat us right. We have right. to treat each other. Right. And I have my fair share of times not doing that. And I have my fair shares of times having to go back painfully and apologize for things mm-hmm. um, through the therapy stuff. But, but that's where it starts. I'm a firm believer that networking and just being nice to each other and just listening. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, you know, the holidays are coming up, right? So we always know that in animal health, it's, we're going to have death week. Because everybody euthanizes their animals away from family to come home and euthanize their animals. And it's, it, you'll have hard weeks. It's, and especially if you work in an emergency, you're really going to have hard weeks. But I think that having a team that empathizes with each other that says, you know, we, it is hard. It is hard. But let's remember that next week it's going to be puppy week. And, and it's very cycle of life. And you if you have that perspective and you have somebody who can pull you out of the hole rather than pulling you into it. I think that is incredibly important. And it's one of the kind of the fears, you know, when we talk about mental health and veterinary medicine, I fear we are talking about the negatives all the time and we never talk about the positives. And if you don't have hope, if you don't have gratitude, um, if you don't have faith that it will get better, then it won't, it won't. And and because it becomes useless to try to, to try to fix it, you know, so we have to understand that there are a lot of really great people out here working, you know, like what you guys are doing. I, you know, there's a multitude of people who are teaching leadership and and helping us with different kind of things like that, even veterinary social work that helps oh, yes. our clients um, cope with the stress of negative diagnosis or even euthanasia of their pets so we we can put new systems in place that will make our profession a better place um because the animal's place in the family has changed dramatically in the 30 years since i've been doing this profession and i can tell you that now we are we're pediatricians and we need to realize that we are uh, we always have been, we just didn't know it, but we, now we need to work that way that we are pediatricians and be really uh, communicative with our clients. So Anna, um, tell me, you know, what advice would you give to somebody who was facing this big career or life decision? How would you tell them to keep moving forward? It's okay if you have days where you're not moving forward, as long as they're days and not weeks. Um, yeah, it, it, it is, that is hard because, um, you almost have to be surrounded and in the right place. Sometimes I, at least anyways, I had to be in just an environment that allowed for that margin. And it's, and it's difficult in our field because again, we thrive in chaos for the (laughs) Part, for the most part and and so to not have that and kind of heal I think that can be difficult for people if they do make a job change um you know I know that some people look at having numerous jobs as like oh my gosh this person's hospital hopping yeah they probably are probably absolutely um and you can figure out why but I also <laughs> encourage that nobody's nobody's gonna like this part but I encourage it if it's just not the right place for you yes I really do. Um, when, when I interview, I really don't look at where they came from. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I care if you have soft skills, mm-hmm. care if you have soft skills and good communication skills, um, obviously for tech work, tech work too, but, um, but, but it's okay. If it's, if it's not a good clinic for you, if it's not a good clinic for this person, it may be the right one for the other one. So I, my advice would be, it's okay to keep looking. 
for what you need because you may not even know what you need. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they're, they're out there. And, you know, if you, you talked about, we thrive in chaos, but I have a practice that's fear free certified, aha uh-huh, accredited. And for me, it is the slowest paced practice. It moves in a snail's pace. And I'm like, oh my God, this would drive me crazy because there's not enough activity going on, but everything is methodical and calm and it's like going into a spa. And then I have other practices that are like, bang, 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 bang. There's stuff going on all over the place, but everybody thrives in a different atmosphere. And a lot of it is, is determined by the leadership of the hospital, like what, how they thrive and you surround yourself with a team who does it thrives in that same atmosphere. But if you're, if you're not a good fit, that doesn't mean it's a bad practice. It just means it's not the right one for you. And changing practices is certainly okay. I think there's a lot of fear involved in that. It's like, what if the next one is worse than this one? Right. You've got to ask the right questions. You've got to talk to people. When you go in for that interview, I, I tell young veterinarians all the time, I said, talk to the staff. And one of the questions I want you to ask is how long have you worked here? And if everybody has worked there less than six months, it, unless it's new and a startup, then uh-oh, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh-oh, why right? is that the question? Why do you not have people who have at least five or six years of longevity working in this practice? Because it means it's miserable, right? So, um, you know, just just really interviewing the hospital and not just saying, you know, here I am, I desperately need a job. I go, no, me, let me interview you on the other side too. And that's actually okay. So tell me a fun fact about you. Do you have a secret talent, a favorite song, something people would be surprised to know? I am so boring. I am your typical mom who wants to binge on Netflix and stuff, which is wow. Oh, there's, I'm just want to say there's a lot of people that's saying that's negative. I think that's great. Sometimes you need to veg. Um, I guess a weird thing that I'm even embarrassed to tell people sometimes is I'm obsessed with World War II documentaries (laughs) (laughs) and I will spend time on Reddit even in the, I can't believe I'm telling you this, in the World War II, um, conversations and chat rooms about military tactics I have zero military background for the record <laughs> you would think that I did but I that whole thing fascinates me uh-huh. uh, so yeah if if it's on there which my kids say it's depressing because it's all black and white yes but it's just something about that war even though it's terrible still fascinates me and so um so yes quite obsessed with that now he's learned to open a drawer my lord Oh, oh, he's so small. This puppy. Anyway, well, um, yeah, anything you would like to say about yourself or the new hospital or uh, a favorite book that you have read that um, you like or a quote that motivates you, shout out to a person that changed your life. <laughs> all of the things, all of the things. All of the things. All of the things. Uh, yeah, obviously, thanking my husband and my kids for being patient with me. There were so many times where I'm like, I don't, I can't stand myself. I don't know how you're standing me. So it just truly having their support and my husband's support um, through those bad times. Um, that, that was, a, that was amazing. Um, every place I've ever worked again, I really like thank those, those people and those doctors because it's teed me up for where we are. Um yeah, and did want to thank our local CAC, uh, the Julie Valentine Center, and my therapist um, and victim advocate, and just that whole team there and how they truly come alongside you and and just help you get your voice back so that then when you go to the therapist, it's not, how do I make a vet- better veterinary practice? It's, you know, it's, hey, help me love myself kind of thing. So I... I do, again, just encourage anybody to, to please, if that is something that's in your background and you're doing okay, that's great. That's great that you're doing okay, but, but please reach out to somebody because there will be a time where it's probably not going okay. Yeah. And, and I like the fact that you said, this is a, this is for a child um, advocacy, but you were not a child when you went, but you were a child when you were abused. And so you still got help and the people there 
related and understood where you were coming from. So excellent. Well, Anna, uh, always a pleasure spending time with you. So thank you very much for being on the band today. And I know the audience is going to appreciate, you know, all the, all the words that you've said and the guidance that you've given and the openness with which you have shared your life and, and hopefully that it inspires somebody else to, um, to say it's okay. You know, I can, I can get through this and I can go and get some help and I can, I can be Anna <laughs> who is now doing cool things and starting up companies. So yay. So excited. So excited. Thank you for having me again. I blush anytime I get to talk to Debbie Boone as a fangirl. So, so, so yes, I, I told my boss, I'm like, it's a bucket list check. So, um, <laughs> So no, thanks for mentoring me. Thank you for always guiding me in the right direction, never giving me the answer, but showing me where to find that answer. So I appreciate it. And people listening, you're doing what you should be. You're just trying, right? So that's it. We all just do the best we can with what we got to work with every single day. One yeah. Around the other. That's it. Yeah. All right. Yep. Thank you again, Anna, for being on the bend. And thank you to people who are listening. Uh, we will put uh, contact information and the show notes. And so if you have a question for Anna, if you want to reach out, if you want some information about the resources that she mentioned, I'm sure she will be glad to share that with you. So thank you again for being with us today on The Bend. Thank you. See ya. See ya.